John 15, 9 through 13. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you may, jo may joy <clears throat> may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. So be it. perfectly with the message and you had no idea what the message was and don't you love Debbie's heart and her enthusiasm and thank you Merle too I don't want to leave you out I'm in a mood today I'll warn you <laughs> Sherry and I went to the lake yesterday and there is such a world out there that is living as if there is no God whatsoever. People are so rude, self-centered, it's hard to see any light out there. Even driving in this morning, I hit the 35 zone coming down the hill and I'm still doing 45, I'm doing wrong. I get past like I am sitting still. And then I go by and see all the work, construction going on, everything else. And you remember when you used to on Sundays everything was shut down? At least there was some reverence whether you didn't go or not you to church or not. It still there was some reverence there and there seems to be none in this world today. And I look even here and I see our crosses and everything and they're polished up. We've taken the blood and the gore out of the message of the cross. And all those songs said that. That God would send his son to be brutally persecuted, to be ridiculed, to be spit upon, to be pierced for our transgression, to be crushed by God himself for our sins. We really need to light up this world for Jesus. So this message is going to be entitled Message of the Cross, but i got a video I want to play first. I decided to play it coming in because it talks about what I just said a little bit.
Logan, my battery is dead, not mine, but this, just so you know, my battery's good. In case I fade out, I'll just get louder, okay? Father in heaven, we do thank you for the cross. That Jesus, your only son, was obedient, knowing what he would have to go through because of his compassion and love for such a pitiful creation as we are that we would rebel and sin against the one that created us, the one that gave us the law, the one that conti continued to love us in spite of our ridicule for you and our shame for you and our denying you. Father, we thank you that you are just and holy and compassionate. And we thank you that Jesus gave up heaven, gave up his life to save us. Help us to take seriously the message of the cross to realize that we are Jesus' hands and feet in this world, that we are not our own, that we are bought with the precious blood of your only Son. Father, fill this place with your Spirit today and lead us to righteousness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we are 2,000 years later reading this letter to a church that looks so much like the church today. 2,000 years... And we should have, the church should have stamped sin out. Not because of what we do, but because of the power of the message of the cross. The power of the Holy Spirit. If we would take seriously that message and live as Christ, as Christians should. So, so far in the letter of the Corinthians, I'll give a brief review Chapter 1, Paul greets and tells them that they are called. Each and every one of us is called by God. He said, Alan, I am calling you. He's called you by name. And we say we answer the call, but do we? we the call is from God. How much would you answer a call from your boss or from the governor or from the president? God called you to be holy, set apart. And the reason you can do that is simply by faith because His Son took all of your punishment and all of your shame. Then Paul thanks the church. He thanks them and tells them that they have every... Oh, it's the battery. Okay. You want to change it, dump it? Just shut it off. All right, I'll get louder. My battery. simply to breathe because we didn't have oxygen outside. Oh, but we have to put on a mask to go in the store. And some of us want to use our freedom to say, I'm not about to. I'm going to put it on my arm. Not on my mouth. Because we don't think of others' needs before our own. We are called to be different from the world. I didn't see anybody yesterday that looked any different than the rest of them out. I don't mean that ugly. I just didn't see any, I didn't see any compassion, any courtesy. All I saw was me, myself, and I everywhere that we went yesterday. So we just could have back home as quickly as we could. But we shouldn't do that either. We shouldn't set ourselves aside over here. We've got to be a part of the world. Paul says that in this letter. 
But we've got to look different from the world. We've got to look like Jesus. What does Jesus look like? One that gave up all of his rights for others. That went silently before the cross and it didn't look polished up like this. Many people had been executed on it prior to that. It was filled with blood and dirt and shame and ridicule. And Jesus went silently, an upright, just man, unjustly accused because he loved you and I. And we're supposed to be like Jesus in the world. So Paul gives a call for unity rather than division. He gives a vision for the church. Be united as one body, the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Until he returns, he will return for you. But in the meantime, you're going to have to suffer like he did. It's well worth the price. Then we get to what I call the key verse. And not many people will say, I look through all the key verses in First Corinthians, and of course we'll get love. Because we're getting to love. If we had love, we didn't, wouldn't have all this division in the first place. But 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And that word is an ongoing word. They're continuing to perish, will continue to perish, will forever perish. But, complete opposite, to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Same word again. I could say being, being, being saved, saved, saved. Because it's a continual process. Yes, you've been justified. Yes, you've been sanctified. But you should grow in maturity to you are 100% sanctified, 100% like Jesus Christ, 100% like the Father. So what is the message of the cross to you? And are you telling others that message? He goes on to talk more about wisdom versus foolishness. Because, see, we can be so easily distracted by the things that the world says is wise. But they are so foolish. No matter how sound the argument is. No matter how rational, rational it, it sounds. If it's not in line with Scripture, it is wrong. It is a lie from the devil. You've got God's words right here. You've got his law. You've got his love letter to you. You've got everything you need. Plus, you've got the Spirit of God living inside of you, which will reveal this to you. Chapters 2 through 5, we read about seeking true power and wisdom from the Spirit of God. That we should feed and grow to maturity. That we are fellow co-workers in this mission. Each having a vital part. It doesn't matter if one plants and one waters. Who cares? We're doing it for the kingdom to grow Christians. To train up disciples. So that our children and their children don't die in eternity set apart from God. In a literal burning eternity called hell. Because of their sins against the almighty holy God. That's why we looked last week at what the Old Testament had to say. And each work from each worker will be evaluated by God. What did you do with the power that I gave you, with the word I gave you, with the gifts that the Spirit gives you? What have you done with it in your life? You're one shot at this. The one that Jesus Christ purchased with his own blood, the covenant written in his blood, the covenant that says nothing can ever separate you from God. If you believe in Jesus Christ. Then he goes on to say. Your body is the temple. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says. Do you not know. That your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And that doesn't mean. Just don't do things to your body. Don't uh, be involved in these sexual things. Or in these other things. It means that your body. Is to be used by God. He purchased you. So not only do you abstain from the sin. You set yourself apart as holy and different for God's work. So you're not just saved and sitting here and say, well, I don't do this anymore. You do this instead. You do what Jesus does. 
Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Do what Jesus did with his body. What do you do with your body? He goes on to tell us to serve and build wisely, to do it together. No one is any more important or any less important. The Spirit gives out gifts according to the Spirit's purpose to do God's will, to do Jesus' work here on earth. And he goes on to say to purge the sin from your body and even from the body of Christ. Now, thank goodness I haven't had to do that. But it's a cancer if you see people that are continually doing what they know is wrong and bringing it into the church to the point where this church said, it's acceptable, it's okay. That kind of body is sick and dying and will not function and nobody wants to be a part of it. They don't want to be like that body. And praise be to God that we have a church that's not that He goes on to say, get rid of sin, sin, sin. Because he talks about so many things, doesn't he? And then when you're through with those, get rid of some more sin. Because you keep reading and you're like, really? I thought that they did this too? But how many times do we throw stones when we need to examine ourselves instead? Run this race called your life to win it for the kingdom, not for yourself. It doesn't matter. It doesn't profit a man if he gains everything in this world and loses his own soul. And what about the blind that you blindly led with you to destruction, where instead you could have led them to the light by being light? Remember from Israel's past, God's chosen people. What God did with disobedience. The standard is even more true with this new covenant written in the blood of His Son. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 and 33 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Do not become a stumbling block. Try to please everyone in all you do. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many that they may be saved. That should be your purpose. That should be your message. Paul goes on to say, imitate him as he imitates Christ because he gave up everything. If anyone could boast, it would be Paul. But instead, he laid it all down. And don't think he's boasting there. Don't think he's comparing himself to someone else or he's mad or upset. He's saying, look, I am the one that fathered this church. You came to salvation under me. You know my background, everything else. If anyone should have a right to boast, it would be me. But instead, I laid it all down so that you might be saved. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And then he has to go on to say more about get rid of sin, sin, sin. Get rid of all these sins. You don't think you have any sins? Stop and examine it for, for a minute. Find out what that sin is. Get rid of that sin. Because if you don't, it's going to lead to more sin. Every time we compromise, it's a slow fade till all of a sudden we don't recognize what we thought we were anymore. And we're lying in the mud in a foreign land. But even then, you can come to your senses and you can get up and come back to your Father in heaven. Wow. What a wonderful God that we should be praising and honoring. With our bodies, our lives, because they were bought at a price. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 and 2, that's the last chapter we read, it was 1 Corinthians 12. We're leading up to a more excellent way, which is love, in chapter 13. But 1 Corinthians 12 begins this way. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. This is one of the biggest dividing points in the body of Christ is spiritual gifts still today. 
It seems to be by this letter, it was one of the biggest, if not the biggest, dividing point in this church. Because they didn't love, they thought they were free in Christ, and they wanted these spiritual gifts, and then they lorded the spiritual gifts over each other, rather than using the spiritual gifts to build up one another. And the reason that you build up the body is so that the body can function properly, so that it can be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. And they, they instead were arguing about their gifts. And I also want to point out exactly what this verse says. Verse 2. You know that when you were pagans, you know that. You've come to that realization if, if in fact, you've come to the realization that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. You know that you were a sinner destined for eternal destruction. And now you've been offered mercy. You've been given eternal life. You know what you were before. How you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Why in the world, with the power of the Holy Spirit living in you, would you still want to be led astray to mute idols? Oh, Pastor, but I don't have idols in my life. Uh-huh. Sometimes it's just that recliner, isn't it? It's comfortable. I don't want to get out of it to go do this because my wife asked me to. When I should think of needs, her needs over mine. When I should lift her up. And I could go a lot further than that, but I'll just go with that little example. You're being led by spiritual forces. Either by the Holy Spirit who lives in you, or you're rejecting that leadership that influence and you're being led to mute idols we fight a spiritual warfare and we have to take our armor off lay our life down and pick up the cross put on God's armor and fight this spiritual battle as we stand apart from the world as we let our light expose darkness so that they see our good deeds and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Many gifts are given to the body. Not just the list that you see here or in another letter. Many gifts are given to the body of Christ. To every individual there is given a gift. Some, more than one. But everybody has at least one. What is your spiritual gift? We talked about that on Friday night. If you don't know, you definitely need to know. And if you're not using the gift that has been given to you, if I give you a gift and find out you table it and not using it, I doubt I'll give you another gift. Because you didn't appreciate the gift I gave you. Especially if it was something that I poured my blood out for. Know what your gift is and use it. And that takes brothers and sisters letting you know what your gift is by building you up saying, thank you, Debbie, because you have a gift in picking out the music and leading the music. And that lifts me up. So I try to tell her as often as I can. Because it's such a blessing to me. Many gifts to many different individuals to build up the body of Christ. Not for any other reason, but to build up the body of Christ. As God tells the Spirit to do it. <coughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 7. There are different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different <coughs> ministries, but the same Lord. There are different ways of working, but the same God works all things in all people. Just as there is the Trinity, the church is supposed to be like that. The gifts, the ministry, everything else. We're supposed to be working to co cohesively as one body. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And then verse 11 says, All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, who apportions them to each one as he determines. The church is the body of Christ here on earth until he returns and claims the church for his own. That's where we've read. That's where we're up to. But yet our world looks so much 
still like the church in Corinthians. Paul gives an example, too, of a human body. As we read on in verse 12, the body is a unit, though it is composed of many parts, and although its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, and we're all given one spirit to drink. Verse 18, in fact, God has arranged the members of the body, every one of them according to his design. Many different parts to function as one body. Verse 25, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its members should have mutual concern for one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ. Did you hear that? Now you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a member of it. If I don't have this arm, I suffer as a body. Someone is the arm in this church. Realize what gifts you have and use them. And this arm should never say to this arm, I don't need you. Let me go try to pick up something that I need both arms for. It's a simple analogy that Paul is using to talk about the body of Christ. Because this church, this body, is so divided that they're not like Christ in the world. A desire for greatness. The chapter ends with eagerly desire. I could put the word covet in there, actually. It would work. Because God has designed us that way. It is a sin to covet the things of this world, but to covet God and His gifts is not a sin. And He's not saying here now, well, desire these greatest gifts so you can lord it above. He's saying, because I got a gift again and I appreciate it, I desire another gift. Next time, if you gave me this gift and it was really neat and I used it, you're going to give me something a little better, a little nicer? Of course your Heavenly Father will give to those that ask. That's His pleasure. That's His will. That is the church. That is the message of the cross. So eagerly desire, be zealous for the greater gifts. And now, as you read next week, I'm going to show you an even more excellent way. If you realize the love that was poured out when God himself was killed on this tree. And he didn't, no one did it to him. He did it himself for you. No greater love that a man has to lay down his life for his friend. And if you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the chosen one of God, if you believe he's the way, the truth, and the life, then you are his friend, not his enemy anymore. And as we read in the scripture, if you are his friend, you will obey his commandments. That's how people will know that you belong to God. But the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. They won't understand it. Why would God do that? Why would he just show himself so we would know it? He did. He showed it in an act of passion that is hard to comprehend. It does seem foolish till you realize how much God loves you by doing that. Someone had to pay the price for your sin. So Jesus said, here I am, use me. Will you follow after him? Because to those who are being saved, the message of the cross is the power of God. It is the power that will transform you. It is the power that will shed light to this world and stamp out darkness. If the church were doing what they should do, this world would look different, wouldn't it? Instead, like the video said, 
There are mega churches out there. There are so many Christian literature out there and songs and everything else. But does the world look better? I don't think so. I gave you one simple example in the fact that Sunday used to be a day that was different. But not anymore. We need to take seriously as the church the message of the cross. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation. And there is a world out there that thinks it's foolish. And they're perishing. Paul also wrote to the church at Philippi in Philippians 3, 7-11. Whatever was gained to me I count as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that I count all things as a loss compared to the surpassing excellence of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness from the law, but which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. You won't know the power of his resurrection without knowing the power of his death on the cross. He suffered and died for you. As the song, uh, him saying that Debbie did, what do I have to give him but my life? <clears throat> I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to him in his death. And so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. He wrote this to the church at Galatia, Galatians 2, 20 through 3, 5. I'm reading from the NLT this time. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if keeping the law could have made us right with God, there would be no need for Christ to die. Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? Evil spell, what? You are being led by the Holy Spirit or you're being led astray. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made cl as clear to you as if you had seen the, a picture of his death on the cross. Because they weren't there. This is afterwards. We've seen it, but the cross didn't look like this again. They were told what Jesus did. They knew what crucifixion was. And it appalled them. This was a terrible act. And Jesus willingly went to die for you and I. As clear as they had seen a picture of it themselves. Let me ask you a question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You receive the Spirit because you believe the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by any human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It's because you have believed the message you heard about Christ. The message that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, would die horrifically for you. So what does the message of the cross mean to you? Will you suffer shame for Jesus? The shame that he suffered for you? Will you suffer pain for him? Will you die for him? Jesus says you can't be his disciple if you won't take up your cross and follow after him. He also says that if anyone will come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. They knew exactly what taking up a cross meant. It wasn't a piece of jewelry they wore around their neck. It was a symbol of shame and suffering for the one who suffered and died for them. The passion, the love that God had for even his enemies. 
that Christ, his only son, would die for them. In John, we read this. This is some of what Merle read. John 15, verses 12 through 19. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not understand what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, because everything I have learned from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will remain. So whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. This is my commandment to you, love one another. If the world hates you, understand that it hated me first. If you were of the world, it would love you up as its own. Instead, the world hates you because you are not of the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. Now let me ask you a question. How many times has somebody seen you in the grocery store? Nah, it just happened the other day, kind of. And they said, ah, oh, you're a Christian. <coughs> Your light's not shining big enough then. Because I guarantee if you start talking about Christ, you're going to offend some people. But the message of the cross is the power of God working out salvation instead of foolishness. And they're not going to know if you don't tell them. And they're not going to know if you don't live like Jesus. What an honor if someone would spit in your face because of Jesus. Scripture tells us that. Here's how the message says this. This is my command. Love one another the way I loved you. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on your line for your friends. You are my friends when you do the things that I command you to do. I am no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what their master is thinking and planning. No, I've named you friends because I've let you in on everything that I've heard from my Father. You didn't choose me. Remember, I chose you and put you in the world to bear fruit, fruit that won't spoil. As fruit bearers, whatever you ask the Father in relation to me, he gives you. But remember the root command, love one another. If you find the godless world is hating you, remember it's got its, got its start hating me. If you lived in the world's terms, the world would love you as its own. But since I picked you to live on God's terms and no longer on the world's terms, the world is going to hate you. Paul's leading up to the most excellent way, which Jesus already taught us. Love! What greater love could God have than to send his son to take our punishment and shame? So that we could live up to his holy standard. That we could cry daddy and he could say good job son. Good job daughter too. Pathetic message. Paul also wrote this in Galatians. For you brothers were called to freedom. But not to use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Rather to serve one another in love. You're seeing a pattern. You're seeing the most excellent way. The entire law is fulfilled in a single decree. Love your neighbor as yourself. We know what your neighbor means. <clears throat> but if you keep on biting and devouring one another, watch out or you will be consumed by one another. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh craves what is contrary to the Spirit. There's that spiritual battle where you're going to be led one way or the other. And the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh, they are opposed to each other so that you do not do what you want to do. Plain and simple. It's common, it is a fact, that man wants to do what he wants to do. But you, you were bought with a price. You have the power of God living in you to do what he wants you to do. Paul said earlier in 1 Corinthians 2, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 
the message of the cross. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with per persuasive words or wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith would not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. The message of the cross is what brought them to salvation. But how far have they fallen from the message of the cross? 1 Corinthians 1.18. If you haven't got that verse now, you should have it memorized. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us, the ones who are being saved, it is the power of God. Is this your message? True freedom is found on the cross. We experience freedom when we are crucified with Jesus on the cross. That's why he says you must deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow him. The devil has no power when you do that. The old nature, the old man, the old self, the old sin has been nailed to the cross with Jesus. You are free to use the power of God to change you, to transform you, to be holy, set apart for God, to draw others home. It's no longer me that will live then, but Christ living in me. The things of the world won't matter anymore because I will want to know Christ and His suffering. So that I can know the power of the resurrection. Paul said, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ crucified, the message of the cross. If we love the message of the cross, our lives will show it. On the cross, we have fellowship with one another. We're all joined together in this same instrument of persecution and death for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll know what our vision is, what our goals are. We'll be drawing others to salvation. A living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of service, by the way. Unfortunately, the message of the cross, like we saw in the video, is not the message of the church so much anymore. Maybe not in 2,000 years. Maybe it wasn't. I know it is here and there. Don't get me wrong. And our church, say add a boy and add a girl again, is the wonderful church I've ever been in. And you know why? Because I feel the love. But we still need to spur one another, as Scripture says, on to good works so that the world sees that also. The message of the cross is love, mercy, grace, forgiveness, adoption, gratitude, obligation, peace, hope, power, rebirth. But it's also pain, suffering, ridicule. It's unjust. It's death. Dying for the one who gave his life for me. After Peter professed that Jesus was the Christ, this is Jesus' words to him in Luke. If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake... He will save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and of my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. The cross is the message that you and I are to proclaim. Love is not love until it motivates and permeates everything that you do. The love that was poured out on the cross 
exactly what Jesus did for you. John Wesley was returning home from a service one night. He was robbed. The thief, however, found his victim to have only a little money and some Christian literature. I guess the thief wasn't thinking about that, was he, when he robbed the preacher? As the bandit was leaving, Wesley called out, Stop! I have something more to give you. The surprised robber paused. My friend said, Wesley, you may live to regret this sort of life. If you ever do, here's something to remember. The blood of Jesus cleanses you from all your sin. The thief hurried away, and Wesley prayed that his words might bear fruit. That simple message. Years later, Wesley was greeting people after Sunday service when he was approached by a stranger. What a surprise to learn that the, this visitor, now a believer in Christ, was a successful businessman, the one who had robbed him years before. It doesn't take a dramatic sermon. Look at Peter's at Pentecost. You're a sinner. Jesus loved you. Loved you. He loves you. He gave his life for you. Think about it. You don't have to have eloquent words. Paul says that in this letter. You need to preach Jesus Christ crucified. <clears throat> the man said, I owe it all to you. Wesley said, oh no, my friend, not to me, but to the precious blood of Christ that cleansed you from all of your sin. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us it is the power of God to salvation. The message of the cross is not truly a message until you live out the love of Jesus Christ in this world. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the love that was poured out on the cross. Oh, how we cannot fathom without you revealing to us Reveal to us more and more so that we can be like Christ. Why would you send your son to die for us except that you are a God worthy of all praise, glory, and honor? You created us. You give us life. You, you are the creator of all things. How dare we first of all ever blaspheme and disobey you? And then how great... A love that you would have that you would pour out your son's life, blood, to save us. Thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross. Thank you, Spirit, for filling us. And thank you, Father, for your love and compassion for us. May we live a life that brings glory and honor to you. Bless this church in Jesus' name.